I personally didn't enjoy 2023, but I already made a separate video on that. One thing I did find good about this year, however, are the shows and movies we got. I have a good variety of stuff I've seen this year, so let's get down to the ranking. But before we begin, there will be some ground rules. Number one, everything here is my opinion and my opinion alone because I have some hot takes in here. Two, I am only counting 2023 media, so no films and shows from previous years, otherwise we would be here all day. Number three, the only media I am covering is movies and TV show seasons, so no video games, books, comics, etc. Number four, I won't be including shows I haven't finished, but I will include shows that are still airing as of January 2024, so for example, Invincible Season 2. Number five, I won't be including shows that started in a previous year but continued into 2023, which is a shame because I really want to talk about the finale of Attack on Titan, but Chainsaw Man is so 2022 and that doesn't feel right including it here. Number six, there will be spoilers in this video for pretty much everything. Everything will be listed in the description for heads up. Anyway bros, let's get down to business. I know I'm starting at the bottom, but isn't this a great start? I watched the original Clone High back in the summer and I really enjoyed it. And this is coming from someone who does not give a crap about teenage dramas, albeit Clone High makes fun of that a lot. Sadly, after one season, the show was cancelled due to Gandhi being too controversial, which is a shame because he's easily the best character. Since we knew Clone High was returning in 2023, I was ecstatic, and I'll admit, when I watched a reboot for the first time, I didn't think it was that bad, but after thinking about it, I knew something was missing. Something didn't feel right, and it wasn't just Gandhi. So I rewatched the first episode of the original, and I realized, this fucking sucks. <laughs> now, many other YouTubers have torn Clone High 2023 to shreds, so I'll just go over my main points of interest. One thing that really bothers me so much is the continuity and its inability to explain things. For example, Gandhi was mentioned in episode 1 twice by Abe, yet in the finale apparently it's mentioned that all of the memories of Gandhi were erased for no reason. I don't really understand why I did that in universe, do they remember Gandhi or not? There's also another episode where they go over Mr. B's backstory before he met Scudworth. I really like this episode, too bad it fucks with the continuity of the original. And that's the thing, it's as much of a love letter to Clone High fans as a bullet was to the original John F. Kennedy. Help, they ruined the characters by a lot. A basically just plays the role of Joan in the first season. I hate Joan F. K. Yes, that is the ship name. And Cleo is just a generic mean girl. Oh, but wait a minute. To make up for the loss of Gandhi, we get new characters. Woo! I will say that my favorite is Frida Kahlo because of the colorful aesthetic and if it's a character and I like a personality, this actually does feel like a teenage clone of Frida Kahlo. But the siege inducing colors do not work for Harriet Tubman or Confucius. My god, I hate these two. Harriet just has the stereotype of one in good grades and that's about it. She's pretty forgettable to me and what the hell is the design? She looks more like a total drama OC than a clone of an anti-slavery activist. Seriously, imagine if she had a background like that. But oh my, what have they done to Confucius? They turned a philosopher into a fucking TikToker. Not to mention, he looks even less like his original counterpart than Harriet. He is easily my least favourite character. Oh yeah, there's also Topher Bus who is actually pretty good but he never appeals, and when he does, he's either being a dick or using PC humour, which was never funny to begin with. Now, I won't be giving this one star despite the fact I've been shitting this a lot because I can... Oh god, kind of relate to this. With a show this bad, I feel a little embarrassed I could feel Abe, but Abe is retarded now, and his love for Joan came out of basically nowhere, so I will now go back to listening to Radiohead Nightcall with my Joker profile picture. That aside, the reboot is worse in every single way. The characters suck, the jokes are either the most basic blue humour or random violence, and the continuity is comparable to modern Simpsons. Even if you remove the context that they're all meant to be clones, this still is just a terrible show, so 2 out of 10. I will just cut to the chase. I typically hate comedy horror, unless it's Spree, I love you Spree. It is hands down one of my least favourite movie genres because they try to be funny yet also scary and you get movies that, in my opinion, just turn into an absolute mess. The Babysitter Killer Queen, Gremlins 2, and House are films I just did not enjoy or lost brain cells watching. At least House has done charm to I guess. Anyway, Totally Killer is basically just a Walmart Back to the Future, but instead of the protagonist making her appearance fall in love in 1955, she has to fight this guy who looks like a fusion between Michael Myers and Donald Trump in the 1980s, so her mother doesn't get killed in the future. 
that actually sounds like a really cool plot on paper, but they mess it up big time by making it a comedy horror. Also, all of the jokes are just about how people in the 1980s are meanies. Ooh. In defense, in Back to the Future, Marty was a typical teenager for his time, with being into skateboarding, playing guitar, and he did reference a lot of 80s stuff. For example, at his parents' prom, he did play um, Johnny Be Good. I need to remember the song for a moment. <laughs> but this girl, I forgot her name and I honestly don't care, literally only has one personality trait and that she doesn't like 80s people because they're mean or some shit. Welcome to the world, bucko. There was a time where not everything was woke. Also another thing, recently I've been absolutely hating sex scenes in movies and of course the character's mom and her friends are hornier than BTS stands. I know that this is pretty common for horror movies, but it's just something I want to say because uh, seriously these scenes were painful to watch. <laughs> I think a time travel movie of a modern teenager going to the 1980s and stopping a killer sounds really great on paper, but in execution they just picked the wrong tone for it. I think if they just made it a normal horror, it actually would have been really cool. 2 out of 10. Um, does this even count? I Am Groot is just harmless entertainment for kids despite being in the MCU. It's just baby Groot and a shenanigans, so there's not much to say. I do like how the Watcher is in the final episode, it reminds you that Earth 616 is also under his watch, which helps to feel more tied to What If. But where are the other Guardians, and how do they not see half the shit that unfolds here? Like, Rocket is in one Season 2 episode, but it's just his voice in the background, so he may as well not be in it. But there's this one episode with, like, a killer snowman, and how does nobody see it? Um, actually, you see, the others are on a mission, and this is what Groot is doing while they're away. Okay, first off, why the hell did they just leave the back ramp open? That's just asking for trouble, so most likely the Guardians are nearby or inside the ship. Second, some episodes take place in space and Groot literally destroys an ice cream ship, getting attention of the Nova Corps. How did they not see this? 4 out of 10. This will be more brief because I'm not a Mario fan. I've only played a Mario Party game once, and in fact, I'm not really a video game fan as a whole, but I will say I much prefer Sonic because of its uh, interesting fan base. Anyway, I will say that the Mario movie is Illumination's best movie, even if it's just okay. I do think it does have some fun moments, but it is flawed. Like, there are way, 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 way too many popular songs, and almost none of them fit. Like, ACDC's Thunderstruck, for instance. Is this a movie or a playlist for a school dance? I know that the cast got pretty mixed reactions, but I don't think Chris Pratt Mario was that bad. Not the greatest, but passable at least. The rest of the cast was actually really good. My favourites were Jack Black as Bowser and Charlie Day as Luigi. One thing I will say is this is a love letter to Mario fans is from what I've heard as it's littered with easter eggs galore. Even if I can't relate to them, I do appreciate that because it reminds me of the Lego movie. I'm not the target audience for this as like I said I'm not a Mario fan. But honestly I think if another animation studio like say DreamWorks made this it would be a lot higher in my book and it wouldn't be an animated Spotify playlist that you pay to watch. 6 out of 10. Welcome to the latest entry in the indie show made for depressed 14 year old Twitter artist cinematic universe. Now I usually hear stuff about how good Hell Over Boss is, but I don't trust it because one of the main characters is a goth furry wolf thing and you know what they say, if it's Aunt Tho, it's time to go. Plus all of the if blank was written by Vivzy Pop memes. But one day, my recommended on YouTube was suddenly flooded with videos about this show called The Amazing Digital Circus, and I was all, fine, I'll give it a chance. I will say that for what indie projects can do, this was pretty well made. Not really my thing, but I can appreciate it for what it is. The character designs are cute, and it has an interesting theme of insanity. Better than funny, horny, swearing demons. Now, this isn't perfect by any means. I did notice some animation errors, such as one of the characters here clipping through her body. Um, actually, it's a show about a digital world, so if it, oh my god, fine, but that's still an error. It doesn't seem intentional. Also, this is just a me thing, but this definitely makes me think of those 14-year-old Twitter artists who are part of cult-following animation fan bases. Think Hell Over Boss, like I just mentioned, Invader Zim, Steven Universe, etc. Not saying if you like those shows, you're a goofy edgelord or anything, but 
I'm scared to look up Pomni on DeviantArt, and even the creator herself made a mistake by revealing her age, so there's that. I like it for a small indie studios project, but it's not really my thing. 6 out of 10. Okay, you may be wondering what on earth this is, and why I watched it. One day, I just got home from school with some food I picked up from a local fast food place on a Friday because I was starving and I had a long week. So I went on Netflix to find something to watch and I found this movie on the top of the page. Once Upon a Crime. It seemed to be a murder mystery starring Little Red Riding Hood and it looked so stupid but also so intriguing. So I added it to my watch list and watched it the next day because I already knew what I wanted to watch that day. To my surprise, Once Upon a Crime wasn't actually that bad. It was flawed and had some janky moments, but it was actually pretty okay. I will say that for a movie with a pun for a title, which need I remind you never goes well, it was a decently written murder mystery story. Or at least for the second and third acts. The introduction was all over the place. Like, the witch having the ideology of the guys from the sex offender shuffle, or Little Red Riding Hood instantly befriending Cinderella, which, need I remind you, is the complete opposite message of the original fairy tale about how talking to strangers is bad. What makes it even more ironic is that Cinderella turned out to be the main antagonist. Flaws aside, this is a good turn your brain off movie I recommend, even if it has furry mice. Wait, what? 6 out of 10. Unlike Mario, Ninjago was my autistic heart fixation. Literally. I loved Ninjago to death as a kid. Mm. Since it's a TV show I made to sell toys that really said something about my taste in media, didn't it? That aside, I loved everything about Ninjago as a kid, and the Odie trilogy was perfect. But then Wild Brain came along and ruined everything. And at that point, the show had been running for eight years, I think, and the Odie trilogy was the perfect final arc to wrap up the entire show. Since season 11, the show was getting really old, they began reusing storylines, and the animation lost its charm in my opinion. Okay, that may be nostalgia speaking, but the plasticky animation of the original just felt right to me. Wild Brain looks ugly and over-detailed as hell. After Absolute Disaster was crystallized, we finally got a new show, Dragons Rising. I think starting a new storyline in the Ninjago universe was perfect. I love the new characters. Eren is a good and likeable protagonist. Sora has a really interesting background, and Wildfire is really fun. I also love Imperium, the 1984 East Society Sora is from. This is actually one of my favourite Ninjago villain um, factions. This seems like the perfect way to build off the original. I sure hope they don't mess it. Oh my fucking god, you had one job! Now look, I don't hate the fact they brought the old ninja back, but why are they still the main characters? Even if they're good characters, all good things must come to an end. That's what makes a story valuable. I know little children will get mad if Kai is gone or whatever, but the story doesn't need the ninja. This is a story of Aaron and Sora, not another adventure for the original six ninja that I started getting tired of. Well, five, because Jay is an office man now or something. Point being that after the merge and the introduction of new characters, this could have been something completely fresh and unique. Like, Lego Friends did that. But alas, they blew it. Also, I am a little hurt that they tied this into Core, the worst Ninjago sub-theme, and most of the references are more towards the modern era rather than seasons 1-10 to 10 that I grew up with, but I digress. I think the new guys and villains are great, but it really missed the mark for me. 6 out of 10. Now, Wes Anderson has a very unique style that, in my opinion, works well for storybook adaptations like Fantastic Mr. Fox or another intro on the Switch, which we'll uh, get to later, but Wes can't make nothing but Roald Dahl adaptations forever. Anyway, to tell the truth, Asteroid City was a very mixed bag for me. I know this is just Wes Anderson's style, and I can respect that, but the camera shots and characters felt so dead to me. Like, I couldn't feel any emotion from anyone, to be honest, and I can't really see any personality traits either. The camera was really weird, like, it was basically still the entire time, and when it moved, it always moved at like a perfect 90 degrees to the side. I will admit, I did watch this around the time of exams, and I had to study a movie called What's the Gilbert Grape for camera shots, and techniques in general, thus making me appreciate them more. I know Mr. Fox was similar to Asteroid City, if not the same when it comes to the camera techniques, but 
The difference between the two is Mr. Fox is entirely stop motion. Asteroid City is live action. I know that it's based on a play, but even Broadway films manage to incorporate more dynamic camera shots, even when there's no singing and just dialogue. That being said, I love the color palette. It fits the 1950s aesthetic perfectly. Also, my favorite part of the movie was the alien. This guy's adorable, and he's played by Jeff Goldblum? What? He only grunts a little bit and is entirely stop motion. Do they mean the mascot at the end of the movie? If so, then that's the most expensive guy in a suit I've ever seen. Overall, even though I don't love Asteroid City, I can't appreciate it for being unique compared to most movies. Plus, my last two points of interest saved the film for me a little. 6 out of 10. Now, Indiana Jones was the first old film franchise I fell in love with, and I unironically think it's a million times better than Star Wars. Anyway, the fifth installment grabs my attention, and I did give it a watch. Sadly, it is my least favourite Indiana Jones movie. Not to say it's bad, but it doesn't feel as exciting to me. That probably is because Harrison Ford is an old man now, unless he can't perform his own stunts unlike the previous four movies. Plus, everyone hates Phoebe Waller-Bridge with a passion, which... I won't judge because she's an actress I'm not familiar with, um, although from what I've heard, she plays lots of, of those like stereotypical girl boss characters. That being said, I did enjoy and had some fun with this one, especially the opening scene. I was really impressed by the DH Harrison Ford where I legit believed it was a stunt double. I also loved the cameos from Sala and Marion at the end, and bruh, they killed off Shia LaBeouf's character by sending him to Vietnam. <laughs> One thing I will say is that the ending was very anticlimactic. I think introducing time travel into Indiana Jones would have been extremely interesting, but they go back to the Second Punic War for like five minutes before the supporting cast take Indy back to the present. I was kind of disappointed because Indy was a retired man and didn't have anything else going for him. I think it had potential to have the same impactful ending as Toy Story 3. However, him being reunited with Marion was sweet, so that makes up for it. 6 out of 10. I was bored one day, so I decided to watch Joining the Pandaverse because even though I agree that the multiverse is really lazy writing, I actually think it's a cool as fuck concept and I thought the universe where everyone is a diverse woman to be a pretty batshit crazy yet interesting concept. But honestly, I didn't really enjoy the special much. It wasn't bad, but I didn't care for the AI and smartphone jokes, which were a big part of the special. It just felt really disconnected. Oh well, at least the Pandaverse stuff was pretty interesting to me. I much prefer Not Safe for Children, though. I think the B-plot was so much funnier than Pandaverse's B-plot with OnlyFans, and it also felt way more connected to the A-plot where it's got the theme of internet personalities and how toxic that can be, which is pretty relatable. Plus, I generally can't stand most internet influencers who get 90% of their money from sponsorships nobody will ever use, like, ooh, mobile game number 8,237, that's completely free, and if I join within the first month, I get a shit ton of gifts and premium, ooh. Anyway, I give Not Safe for Children an 8 out of 10 for relatability, and Pandaverse was just a bit more mid with a 6 out of 10, making the overall average a 7 out of 10 for me. Now I am glad that Total Drama is back. It was one of the first shows aside from Ninjago that I binge watched and had such a fun time with it, until Park 2 Island. But when there was word that the show was returning, I was curious on how and if it would be changed. Thankfully, they kept the formula the exact same, and Chris is just as sociopathic as ever, even though I'm sad they had to change his voice actor. CAN WE NOT HAVE ALLEGATIONS FOR FIVE MINUTES?! The new contestants were actually not half bad. I was worried they were all going to be Zuma stereotypes. Okay, some of them kind of were, like, they had their take on those shitty YouTube teenagers who make videos like, Ooh, last to stop blank wins $10,000. Think channels like Old Morgs or Piper Rock Hell. But still, written better than Park 2 Island. My favourite contestants were MK, Scary Girl, and Z. I don't think they could ever top the absolute god tier first season cast, but they didn't do too bad. One thing that really gets on my nerves is that the island that was destroyed back in All Stars is back somehow. Not to mention the new theme song absolutely sucks. 
Still, glad Total Drama is back. Seven out of ten. I'ma be real with you all. Disenchantment was a show I completely forgot existed until I was scrolling Netflix and realized, wait, Disenchantment just ended? A week ago? So I binged the rest of it, and I'd say it's on par with the other seasons. However, it was great to see the story wrap up in a nice way. Bean gets her happy ending, Lucy saves the world, Dreamland disappears for some reason. Now, this might be because I don't remember anything about season 4, but when did Bean get lightning powers? They probably explain it somewhere, but I don't remember anything about that anywhere. It makes the fights involving her more interesting though, but it just seems kind of pasted on. Still, I like Disenchantment and I feel bad for forgetting about it. Especially since The Simpsons is being exploited by Disney and Futurama returned for some reason. Disenchantment was the last groaning show that didn't feel corporate as shit. Whatever, it's a good Matt groaning show and I'll miss it. 7 out of 10. Hot take, season 2 was disappointing in my opinion. I loved the adventure aspect of season 1 of Loki where they explored different timelines and although they still do that in season 2, a lot of it was more inside of the TVA which in my opinion wasn't as much fun. My favourite episode was episode 5 as we finally see where all the main characters came from. And besides episode 3, the other episodes were kind of mid though for me personally. I also think the ending was a little odd with the Loki variant taking over the role of He Who Remains. It was an alright ending to the show I guess, but honestly I really don't care about Marvel Disney Plus shows. Except for one we'll see later in the list. 7 out of 10. I was dreading season 7 as Justin Roiland was no longer on the show and I was really worried about the new voice actors. Thankfully, they were pretty solid, albeit neither were perfect. Morty especially sounded a little off, but I think it kinda works because he sounds more like he's going through puberty. The episodes had their highs and lows. My least favourites were the one where Rick and Jerry swapped to minds but not brains or something. I, I don't know, the episode was confusing as hell. Also, the Quarto episode was just... why? However, I loved the battle with Rick Prime. That was hands down my favourite episode of the season. I also loved the Fear Hole episode, and the Spaghetti Suicide Plan Out one was surprisingly emotional. I will note that barely any of the scenes from the intro were used in the show, which I found disappointing. I'll give Season 7 of Rick and Morty a 7 out of 10. How fitting. I personally don't love the animation of What If as it feels a little plasticky. That being said, I love the concept and by extension, season 1 was incredible. We had fun episodes, yet season 1 had some very dark moments. How does season 2 hold up? Honestly, it's nowhere near as good as season 1. The storylines felt a little bit wasted. For example, What If Happy Hogan Saved Christmas should not have taken up a spot on What If. That could have easily been a 45 minute Christmas special on Disney+. Plus. Just use the script, put it in live action, change the ending so happy is cured, and there we go. I also find it very weird how they made what is basically an OC for What If. Like, I'm not against Kyori, but why did she have to take up an episode spot? She's not even a real Marvel character. Now, you may argue that back in Infinity War, all of Thanos' children were not in the comics, and they were exclusive to the movies. But they were all minor antagonists. This is an entire episode spot dedicated to a character who doesn't even exist. Anyway, I am glad that we finally saw the Sakara and Iron Man episode, and I actually really like the Peggy verse. I'm glad she's back, honestly, although she's a little overused here. We've gotten confirmation immediately after that we're getting season 3, and I hope to god we get some more proper what if scenarios and not more OCs or pointless stories. 7 out of 10. Funny thing is, I can't stand movies about two teenage idiots. Think Bill and Ted and Dude Where's My Car, they're not for me. They just get really annoying after a while. But Beavs and Buddy are different. The movies I mentioned, they're kind of more like, Yo, we're so cool! Stupid. But with Beavs and Butthead, they're just stupid stupid, like negative one IQ. And that makes watching their antics so much fun. I'm glad they got a reboot last year, and the second season did not disappoint whatsoever. 
I also like how it jumps between two continuities where they show the OG universe with their adults and those episodes add a fresh cone of paint where they get into more adult scenarios, like talking to war veterans or joining town debates. I know there's more of a review of the whole show rather than just of the second season specifically, but it's a little harder when they have the same formula as before, and that's okay for here. I really like what Mike Judge is doing with Beavis and Butthead, and I really can't wait for season three. Seven out of ten. Technically, if you think about it, this was Blue Sky's final movie as they started production on it before Netflix took over. Now, I really enjoyed Nimona. The futuristic fantasy world reminds me a lot of Next Nights if it was actually good. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. The film itself has some interesting lore about Nimona's past and how the government is kind of corrupt. I haven't read the comic though, maybe someday. I will say that this film has some of my favourite gay representation in recent media, especially for a Netflix movie. Like, unless you believe in stereotypes, not all gay people dress like this. Or this. They're not all quirky, they don't all act fruity, they play it very casually and it feels realistic to me, and I appreciate that. I also found Nimona herself to be a very enjoyable character. She can be a bit too goofy at times, but generally the scenes with her were really great. I also really like the animation style, it works really well. It makes Nimona's animal transformations feel more smooth and allows for more satisfying action scenes. Overall, this was a really solid film. 8 out of 10. I'm so glad more studios are going for the Spider-Verse art style. With masterpieces like Spider-Verse itself, The Last Wish, it, no, not you intergalactic, you sucked. Basically, I love the look of this film. Spider-Verse went for comic book looks, Puss in Boots went for storybook looks, and this one looks like it was made in a sketchbook and it's absolutely beautiful. Please, give me more animated action movies in this art style. As for the story, it was alright. I'm not in love with Superfly being the main villain, but he's okay, and the other mutants were cool too. One thing I want to note is how accurately this movie portrays modern day teenagers. Like, the way they talk and the interest feels so real to me in how teens actually act and behave. I will say, I do think it's really odd how they made like two or three references to Attack on Titan, especially since most, if not all kids watching, don't know what Attack on Titan is, and honestly, if I were a parent, I would not let my kids watch that show. But no joke, the way they defeat Superfly at the end is exactly how they kill Titans, and they even name drop it. I just don't understand that, as only people who've actually watched Attack on Titan would relate to that. That aside, I love this movie, and now I want to watch the other Turtle movies. 8 out of 10. Now the thing with anime is I only watch it if I'm aware it exists, because there is a lot, and I mean a lot of anime, that is so degenerate that if I would watch it, it would probably put me on the FBI watch list. But one day, I was browsing Netflix and I stumbled across ZOM 100. At the time, only the first three episodes were available. I gave it a watch and I loved the three episodes so much. The animation was incredible, the characters were so much fun, and the idea felt fresh. Instead of being scared of the zombie apocalypse, use it as a chance to finally live your life and it really shows how even in a bad situation, you can still have fun and enjoy your life. And the series has weekly episodes. I sure hope there is nothing that fucks up the show's pro- Oh god damn it! I know this is a brand new studio, but Jesus Christ, never have I seen a show have an airing schedule this bad. And this is coming from someone who waited patiently for Stone Ocean and Attack on Titan Season 4 Part 3. Waiting an eternity for these episodes was a nightmare. And after Episode 9, the show was put on a definite hiatus. That's not very good for your fans. Thankfully, the last three episodes of Season 1 released on Christmas, and... I loved them and all, and thought it was a great ending for the first season, but I hope that when and if we get season 2, they don't make the episodes as they go along. And the show went from a 9 to an 8 out of 10 for me because of that. 
I wasn't going to watch Barbie because I was just kind of expecting it to be a generic Barbie adventure, but in live action instead of... Ah! All I knew about it was that it had Ryan Gosling, who was playing Ken, so, you know, the Sigma males can enjoy it. Then Barbenheimer happened. Now look, I really don't care about following trends, but it grasped my attention on both Barbie and Oppenheimer, which I still need to watch, sorry guys. I decided to give Barbie a watch, and oh my god. It was nothing like I was expecting. <laughs> Keep in mind, I only watched like the first teaser trailer back when it released. It's about Barbie going through an existential crisis and trying to figure out why she's feeling that way. And after that, Ken gets up to his own mischief and turns Barbie land into a place for manly guys and brainwashes all of Barbie's variants into being mates. <laughs> now look, I know this is a movie for female empowerment, so I'm either supposed to ignore this or tell myself it's sexist and hate it like a fatherless Twitter user. But fuck both of those, I love this movie. It was a great comedy with some surprisingly mature jokes, and it does have a good message about female empowerment and how women are wait for it, middle schoolers, are actually kinda cool. And how I think they handled Barbie's relationship with Ken at the end was done perfectly. She didn't shit on him or antagonize him or tell him to kill himself. She was still friendly and accepting, and so the Barbies and Kens could live alongside each other in peace. Ah, uh, if only that was the case in real life. Also, I find it so ironic how an actor who played so many literally me characters played the villain in a movie like this. Just putting that out there. 9 out of 10. I'll start off by saying Roll Doll is the goat of kids' books. I remember having Charlie and the Chocolate Factory read to me as a kid, and it was such an interesting book. About children being mutilated. Netflix had four short films based on short stories by Roll Doll. There was The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, The Swan, The Rat Catcher, and Poison. I absolutely love these, with this one being my favourite as the feeling felt the most familiar to me. That and I thought Rupert Friend was the perfect narrator. Also, the stage play aesthetic, we could see sets being set up and props being given to the narrators, in my opinion, is what Asteroids City should have been. I don't think these were too well perceived, but honestly I don't care. They were just so well made and the narrators did a fantastic job. I highly recommend these. Real quick watches too, actually. 8 out of 10. I grew up with Adventure Time's earlier seasons as a kid alongside Regular Show, Gumball, and Ninjago. We did lose cable when I was like 8, so until we got Netflix, I basically lived off Channel 4, which I'm 99% sure the people who ran it didn't know Family Guy was for adults. Anyway, I haven't seen anything from Adventure Time beyond Season 5, I want to say, so I wasn't too interested in Fiona and Cake, which were characters from a fanfiction Ice King wrote but I was hearing nothing but praise about it, so I watched it. Oh my god, this was beautiful. I love how it goes further into the Adventure Time multiverse, and we see Fiona, Cake, and Simon travel from universe to universe, seen in the original series. Plus, the Scarab is such a cool villain. I love the Scarab. He's awesome as hell. But my favourite thing about Fiona and Cake is Simon. I don't know anything about this Betty girl before watching, but man, this is depressing and hits close to home, honestly. This felt like a personal journey for Simon to let go of his past and regrets. I just feel bad that I have no clue how Betty became... whatever this is. Honestly, I feel like I would have loved to show way more if I completed Adventure Time, but I'm not as attached as the majority of viewers are. I'll give this a 9 out of 10 because I feel like Simon was explored to perfection, but this would have been in my top 2 if I was a true Adventure Time fan. At the time of recording, only the first 4 episodes of Season 2 are out, so I'll mainly talk about them. Season 1 of Invincible was absolutely perfection. It's definitely my favourite western animated show of all time. Like Spider-Man, it perfectly encapsulates trying to balance personal life and superhero life while also having J.K. Simmons as Omni-Man, which is peak. Season 2 so far is interesting, as it seems to introduce the Invincible multiverse, which, like I said, I like multiverses. I don't care if they have lazy writing. Fight me! I also like the post-apocalyptic world where Invincible joined Viltrum. I hope Angstrom Levy appears more and is a true main villain of Season 2, because so far he's basically only really been a character in the first episode. Anyway, I also appreciate how Debbie has much more of a focus here. 
as before she was basically just a background character. But the Battle of the Viltrumites was so, so, so fantastic, and it basically sold me on season two completely. It was well choreographed, had excellent pacing, and brought this meme that I swear to fucking god always finds me on Discord. However, the season is not over yet, and to be completely honest, the main reason it's this high on the list is just because of personal bias, because I love Invincible. Anyway, I'll give the season like a 9 out of 10, as I don't like it as much as season 1, which is a 10 for me. I'll go out and say it. I had a Scott Pilgrim phase in like, early 2023, and whether I'm proud of it or not is still something I'm processing. That being said, Scott Pilgrim is a movie and comic series I totally overlooked. I thought it was just some random deviant looking comic from the 2000s that was only read by nerdy kids. But I decided to look up what Scott Pilgrim was actually about. Okay, this sounds awesome as hell. I love Versus the World and I love the comics. They're the perfect blend of romance, action, comedy, and drama. When I found out later in the year we were getting a Scott Pilgrim anime, I was ecstatic. The animation looked incredible, and they got the OG cast from the movie back. So in November, I got ready for the masterpiece that was going to be Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. Okay, now I understand how some people call this a bait and switch, as they changed the entire story into a murder mystery, and Scott himself was only in like half the episodes. Was it taken by surprise? Yes. Would I have still liked an adaptation of the comics? Yes. Do I still love this? Absolutely. Takes off as just as much action and comedic moments as the film and comics do, yet still having personal moments here and there, like Ramona providing Roxy with closure. I also think that a new story helps shine light on an otherwise overlooked um, character, or characters. For example, Wallace and young Neil are actually really important characters, while the movie focused more on Scott, Ramona, and the exes. I also think Wallace is one of my new favourite Scott Pilgrim characters. Sadly, it seems we won't be getting a season 2, which is a massive shame, because imagine what we could have gotten again. Gideon and Julie being the main villains, Nigga Scott, Lisa finally returning, Scott's troubled relationships, etc. But alas, I love Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. Just please go read the comics first. 9 out of 10. In a time when Marvel is absolutely dog shit, James Gunn gives us Guardians 3, and for some reason it's anything but a modern Marvel movie. Everyone is in character and acting how they should, not suddenly turning into comedians overnight. The CGI is actually great, there's a furry genocide, we have Rocket's past explored, and it's so emotional yet so great. This is the perfect send-off to the Guardians. I've heard people say 2014 Gamora is out of place, which I understand, but how I see it, it acts as a constant reminder of what Peter's lost. It's like the feeling of seeing an ex in class, and the thought is shoved down your throat. This makes me see Peter's grief, and when he grows and gets over it, it feels more rewarding. Plus, finding his grandfather on Earth is really wholesome to see. Radiohead is at the start, and I love Radiohead because life sucks. I love Rocket. Adam Warlock is a bit disappointing, but that's my only criticism. Great soundtrack. There are many moments where you wonder if the characters are even going to survive, really showing how well made they are, because you can care about them so much. The High Evolutionary was a very unique villain in my opinion, method-wise. Did I mention how Rocket is the goat in this movie? 10 out of 10. Perfect Guardians movie in my opinion. Is volume 2 better? Probably, but I like character exploration and relatability, and Rocket took the cake. Is this even a surprise to anyone? Spider-Verse was a beautifully animated, well-written movie with equally great characters. However, Across takes everything good from the original and cranks it up a lot. The animation is even better here in my opinion, where every frame of this movie could be a desktop wallpaper. I love Miles and Gwen, I really hope they f- The new villains are better than the ones in the first film. The Spot is a way cooler and more dynamic villain than Kingpin, and I'm glad he's the film's big bad, because he's a pretty obscure villain. I also love Hobby, Indian Spider-Man, and of course... I don't have a lot to say that's brand new or will add anything, because everyone has already praised across the Spider-Verse enough, and it deserves every bit of it. This is an absolutely beautiful film. 10 out of 10.